Hyvät ystävät, dear friends, please take a seat. Dear friends, um, the last session talked about EU and democracy in the EU and the, the power of citizens. Now we'll f f go on to talk about um, corporations and other illegitimate actors wielding power. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Susan George, an internationally renowned political scientist and activist uh, who is currently the president of Transnational International Institute. Uh, Transnational Institute, I'm sorry, uh, but she's also um, honorary uh, president of ATAC and uh, been active uh, writing about globalization, international trade, uh, food crisis and shortages, and democracy for for the past decades. Uh, Susan, please, uh, has the uh, is going to talk about the danger to democracy that the rise of Ill illegitimate power poses. Susan, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's, and the discussant will be my good friend, and I'm sure a good friend of many of you, Tevo Tevainen. Um, it's always a pleasure to be in Finland and in Helsinki, and I'm extremely grateful to the Kalevi Sorsa Foundation for asking me, and very honored to be here with a very distinguished group of people um, to try out a subject I've spoken on only once before and which I'm trying to develop into some sort of book because I think it's, uh, it's crucial for us as Europeans and as Democrats. Um, usually, as the little introduction says, uh, most people focus on the state and the market. Uh, and the market is part of what I'm going to talk about, but I really want to discuss the question of democracy and the interference in democracy of power unaccountable to anyone, except possibly to shareholders, which I think is illegitimate, and we, where I see more and more signs of this rise of um, people really running our affairs who have not been elected, and not only have they not been elected, but they are very difficult uh, to identify. The um, legitimacy, as far as I'm concerned, in running any sort of affair is a degree of democracy. And by democracy, uh, I, I just say very quickly uh, what I think it has to be, it has to have free and fair elections. It has to have a certain number of attributes like constitutional government, the rule of law, um, equality before the law, the separation of executive, legislative, and judicial powers, all the things that you learned in Political Science 101, right? Uh, we all know these things. We all know the basic human rights. These were identified and they were a very new and revolutionary idea at the end of the 18th century that individuals have rights. Uh, and this was also part of the separation of church and state. The Bill of Rights and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen in 1789 and 1791 were extremely revolutionary documents. And the list of rights is still expanding, and it must continue to expand, because in the 18th century we still had slavery, we still had practically no rights for women, etc., etc. And this is a list which should be expanding. But that's the kind of thing I'm talking about when I speak of democracy. I'm not talking today about, um, shall we say, um, tyranny or African one party, one leader states. No, this is not about, that's not what it's about. It's about the interference of the largest corporations 
in our affairs. And I'm going to use the term transnational rather than multinational. Uh, I use the UN term because I also think that when you get to the top reaches of a company, when you get to the really important things like finance, research and development, and so on, you have <coughs> a, a clear nationality which is recognizable, almost always. Um, you, it's either Swiss or it's French or it's German or it's Finnish, but you can see what it is, and I prefer transnational also for that reason. Um, my hypothesis is that this illegitimate authority is on the rise, that more and more functions of legitimate government are being taken over by the corporations, and I hope to show some proof of this in a series uh, of examples. We have, um, first of all, why should we defend this model? Why are citizens called upon, in my view, to defend this model? Because there is a new ideology afoot. It's been rising for about the last 20 or 30 years. This is the neoliberal ideology, which is an ideology of selfishness and cruelty. Its ultimate aim is to take down the welfare state those who are in charge of um, running this model and keeping it uh, in the forefront are the one percent, if not the one-tenth of one percent. They have a goal, which I think is becoming clearer and clearer. Their goal is to destroy the character of Europe, the basic character of Europe, and they, so I'm being very clear at the beginning because I want you to understand where I'm coming from. They want to claw back the achievements of working people over the past 50 or 60 years, and they see this as an ideal moment when many Europeans are in disarray, don't know where to turn. The problem of youth unemployment has been mentioned by previous speakers. There's a lot more than that. There's the austerity in the South and the disaffection vis-a-vis -vis Europe all over. And we have a very dangerous situation for democracy with the rise of far right-wing parties, extremes, um, some of which are clearly beyond the pale, not legal at all, like, like Golden Dawn in Greece. Others are trying to become more respectable. But in any case, I think they are harmful to nearly everyone. And this ideology of neoliberalism is one which has corporations at its center. It has been thoroughly discredited as an economic model. It's been discredited intellectually, Many papers that were the foundation of this have been shown to be completely wrong with fudged figures. It is discredited practically. It doesn't work. If by working we mean improving the lot of 99% or 95% of the citizens, let's be generous, it doesn't work. And morally, it is causing enormous suffering and great hardship in a number of our countries. And yet, it has triumphed. And we have all the signs of this all around us. Inequality has also been mentioned very often. But let me give a concrete example of this and why and how capitalism is winning. I often like to quote Warren Buffett, the third richest man in the world, who said, there's class warfare, all right, but it's my class, the rich class, that's waging this war, and we're winning. And I think Buffett was right, because since the mid-1970s, what has happened, on average, in Europe, the GDP of Europe, it, it's, you know, economists divide the value added to the economy each year into the share that goes to capital in the form of rents, profits, dividends, and the share that goes to labor in the form of wages, salaries, etc. 
pensions. And since the mid-70s, when the division used to be 70% on average, or a little bit more for labor, and 30% for capital, it's now 60% for labor, down 10%, and 40% for capital. And in many countries, many of our countries, including France, it's more than 40% for capital. Corporate shareholders used to be happy with 3 4% return a year. That was lavish. Now they're demanding 12 13 sometimes 15% returns on investments. This is impossible to sustain. The former goal of building a healthy, long-lasting enterprise business has been overturned. Now the goal is short-term. The goal is shareholder value, in quotes. And what that means is short-termism, asset stripping, mass layoffs, many other negative phenomena. Salaried people have lost 10 points of GDP on average. This is not small change. The GDP of Europe is about 13 trillion dollars. 13 followed by 12 zeros. So that means if working people have lost 10%, that means 1.3 trillion. Now this is important because it's working people's money that keep the economy, it, it keeps the economy ticking over. Working people spend almost all of what they earn. They try to save, of course, but they spend a ho much higher proportion of what they earn every month on goods and services, simply because they're not paid that much. Capital, and the 1%, or if you prefer, the 10%, such people already have much of what they need, and they are putting a lot more into financial products, investing in the markets, but in any case, not consumption, which contributes to the real economy. If you buy toxic derivatives, your purchase is making no social difference of any kind to anyone. Many economists will admit this. It's not social or use value. So we are losing a lot, and it's no wonder that the economy isn't ticking over, because we have removed the capacity to buy from the pockets of working people. I'd also like to bring up uh, just a few points, as I made a list for democracy and what we need for authority to be legitimate. I would just like to give a few highlights of what the neoliberal doctrine believes and what it puts forward. Markets. Markets are wise, efficient, they always know what they're doing and they should always be listened to. They are self-regulating, they don't need government intervention. Regulations are what the doctrine calls job killers and they use this very effectively. They call the unions, at least in the United States, they call trade unionists thugs, in other words, criminals who are battering the working classes into joining the union, but that these people are also job killers, just like regulations. They're for privatization of all the public services, for obvious reasons. That's more money and more power in the capitalist pocket, and they are saying that government spending is intrinsically bad. That was basically the cause of the shutdown in the United States where this doctrine has gone the furthest. Government deficits must be got rid of as soon as possible. I was amused to hear uh, in the last discussion the figure of 3%, these magic mantra figures of 3 and 60%, why not 4 and 65? We don't know. Somebody, somebody made these figures up in Germany, apparently, 30 years ago, and now they are, they are doctrine, they are. But uh, they don't mean anything in particular. And in the United States, a representative from Tennessee voting to cut food stamps for the very poorest people in the United States had the following thing to say as he voted no to food stamps. 
Those who refuse to work shall not eat. Now, does that mean that those people refuse to work or does that mean that they could not find jobs? This is a question that is not asked. The rich don't owe anything to ordinary people and the rich don't owe anything to nature either. So you can see you don't have to be a Marxist to see that the creation of value for neoliberalism comes entirely from investment. It comes entirely from money, from capital. It does not come from work, and it doesn't come from nature. So that, I think, is the basis. That is why there's no respect for the environment, and that is why there is no respect for ordinary working people. So now I'd like to start on my proofs and what I think is happening and give you some examples as talking points that if you agree with me, you can use and you can make more you can deepen much more than I have done so far. And the first step on this ladder is obviously the lobby. Now, lobbies have been around for centuries. The name comes from the lobby of the House of Commons in Great Britain, where from about the beginning of the 18th century, there were people hanging around with envelopes stuffed with pound notes, and they were convincing their their elected representatives of what they should vote for. That's where the, the name comes from. And this is now a tradition so that lobbyists are practically considered part of civil society. Certainly at the European <coughs> Union they are. In the United States they are obliged to register with the Congress. You have to say who's paying you, how much, and who on whose behalf you are talking to uh, elected representatives. In Europe what we have is a joke. Probably most of you know this, but there is a voluntary register, which is a complete joke, because there's 15 to 20,000 lobbyists in Europe. Nobody knows how many uh, exactly, and uh, almost all of them are lobbying on behalf of a company or a group of companies, a sector, a sector of, of the economy. They are non-elected, and they go through what's called the revolving door. One of the most egregious examples uh, is a former Prime Minister of Ireland, John Bruton, who has now become a lobbyist. He has all the right connections, of course. And there are many, many cases of this, of government service and then lobbying, or lobbying and then government service, uh, etc. So this voluntary register is a complete joke. And what has happened in the past week is even worse because uh, they, the, the European Parliament very properly said we can't have this anymore. We have to have a working group which will improve uh, our lobbying system because we're becoming the laughing stock of Europe. So Martin Schulz duly set up a committee and he named another German, a man called Rainer Wieland, uh, as the chair of this group. And last week, Der Spiegel explained that if the working group had not got anywhere, which is true, it is just standing still, this was possibly because Mr. Rainer Wieland, on the side, is himself a lobbyist. He's a member of a law firm in Brussels which regularly lobbies the Commission. So it's not terribly surprising that this group has got nowhere. And of course, two German Green deputies asked immediately for him to be uh, asked to resign from this position and possibly from the Parliament because you're not supposed to have a job on the side. This hasn't been cleared up yet, but that's where we are. So you have the common or garden lobbyist, and these are proliferating, and we don't know exactly what they're doing. It's advancing a little bit, but really at a snail's pace to, to find out what they're doing and for whom. Just above that class of lobbyists, you have the group lobby. Groups of companies which come together in things they usually call councils, or institutes, or foundations, or centers, you have the tobacco uh, council, you have the 
they don't call it the junk food council, but it's, that's what it is, really. It's the food and beverage uh, operation. Usually these are based in Washington, but they always have offices in Brussels and sometimes in other places. And they defend the same sorts of things. They defend alcohol, tobacco, junk food, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, greenhouse gases, uh, vehicles, that sort of thing, but they do it somewhat differently. Um, they employ tame scientists. They pick scientists who are prepared to take money in exchange for writing articles that are on the side of the lobby without, without, uh, without confessing any conflict of interest. Uh, they write studies uh, to try to create doubt in the, in the public's mind. They create debate where there is no debate. We all know that smoking is harmful. Uh, but the tobacco lobby has been able to delay or to uh, cancel legislation for years, and this is still going on. I'll tell you later something about a trial where the tobacco lobby is the main uh, protagonist. They use um, not just tame scientists, but they create groups out of thin air, supposedly citizens groups. This is what are called these are called in the United States not grassroots groups, but astroturf groups. I don't know if this is funny in Finnish at all. In sports events, they roll out big rolls of fake grass, which are called astroturf for sports events, for football and so on. So these are not really grassroots <coughs> groups. They're not real. They don't come from the roots. They come from the lobbyists making them up and they're starting to do this in France. I noticed there's a lobby now, supposedly a citizens group for working on Sunday. We want to work on Sunday. Um, well, uh, there's a group for this, and it somehow turns out to be related to the...